congregation to please rise. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Please be seated. Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Reverend Dr. Richard Dale Pittenger. We come together in grief acknowledging our human loss and uh, we invite God to grant us grace that as we share in this time of acknowledging human loss, we're also mindful that in pain we find comfort in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. We especially praise you for Dick, for whom you have graciously received into your presence. 
To each one of us here this day, grant us your peace. Let the perpetual light shine upon us and help us so to believe where we have not seen that your presence may lead us all through our years and bring us at last with all those, our family and friends, into the joy of your home, not made with hands but eternal in the heavens. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. On behalf of Dolores and the family, we want to thank everybody for coming. I see a lot of faces I haven't seen since I was really small. One of the preachers reminded me as we were rehearsing in the preacher's chorus that dad liked to wax eloquently on the conference floor at times. And one particular day he was waxing eloquently when all of a sudden a person in the back pew or the back of the room shouted, we can't hear you in the back. To which his good friend Glenn Hammerly replied, are there any other seats back there? So if any of you move, <clears throat> I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That was one of my dad's favorite scriptures and it's also one of mine. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. From a very early age, Dad learned the difference between mortals and angels. His dad definitely was mortal, a man of the earth, digging out a basement on a tiny piece of land south of Brookings to raise a family. His wife, Silva, who was an angel in her own right, raising six boys, one of which died in childbirth, would have been a seventh. <clears throat> Dad was the last one by about nine years. His mom taught him about grace there on a South Dakota prairie. Even before he was born, she learned much about life and death. For when she was giving birth to his older twin brothers, her heart stopped for just a minute in the doctor's office. And unbeknownst to her, the doctor frantically tried chest compressions and whatever he could to bring her back to life. And he succeeded. I'm thankful for that. So is my dad. With a gasp and a shout of anger, his mother chewed out the doctor for what she thought was waking her up from the most wonderful dream she'd ever had. She had entered a very large room with a heavenly choir, not unlike the Brown family choir there. The music was like none she had ever heard before. And the colors were just brilliant spectacular. She saw people she recognized from her youth, her parents, aunts and uncles that had died, cousins, neighbors, children who died far too young and others who died before their prime, along with the elders of her family in her dream. Put me back to sleep, she shouted. It's then the doctor said calmly, ma'am, you don't understand. You were not here. He went to the other side. She told dad that story ever since his earliest memory. And with that, his faith in God began to form. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Yes, dad grew up on the farm near Brookings. Dad didn't remember his dad ever owning much of anything. Scrimping and hustling to make a little money here and there at the pool hall in Brookings. Dad was small in stature, weighing just under 100 pounds when he graduated from high school at 17. 
that had faith in who he was and what he could be and how he could change the world with his thoughts and with his witness. Paul goes on to tell us, if I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Dad did never have much. Even when he had it all, he gave clubs to me through the years, to his grandsons and granddaughters. He had very little. Okay, he had a lot of clubs. <laughs> and he had a lot of golf balls. My family edited what I had said before. But he had love. Love for his family, his children, his wife Dolores, grandchildren, stepchildren, great-grandchildren, bowling partners, golf buddies, theological equals, preacher pals and spouses, and toward the end, his friends in Gamblers Anonymous. Some are here today. No, he was never too old. In his mid-80s, when he joined Gamblers Anonymous, you're never too old to change your life for the better. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. I asked Dolores and the family what stood out most for them when it came to memories of my dad. Some said he was a maverick with a cause to change the world for the better, one editorial at a time. Verbose, driven, opinionated, competitive, an orator, impulsive, stubborn, intelligent, but at the same time silly, calm, gentle, mild-mannered, an encourager, a cheerleader, a competitor, I said that twice, joy-filled and grace-filled, a leader in the church, in charge of his thoughts, sharer of his dreams and wisdom, humorist, compassionate, pastoral, respectful, and you can add your own word to that list. He was proud that he shot his age in golf on many occasions, especially in recent years. <laughs> we should all live that long. And I'd ask him, well, what'd you get on the second hole? Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> he never seemed to get mad rarely raised his voice unless it was at the bowling alley and rarely on the golf course, but it was more uh, exasperation. It was usually just to plead his case. Golly, Ned, I was robbed, or you were robbed. That should have been a strike. An armchair quarterback, sporting events and politics alike, Dolores would often hear him shout from his den at the TV. He was held, encroachment, he was out of bounds. Were just a few phrases he'd repeat from back in his man cave watching TV. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Gabrielle said, when she was younger, she and Kess would go to their house in Westford and they'd ask Grandma Dolores where the cookies were. She went on to say she brought us out into the kitchen to show us where the cookies were. They were hidden because she said Grandpa ate too many. And if she had to choose a word or words to describe him, they'd be goofy, loving, hungry, and memorable. Perry said she always felt his unconditional love, no matter what. Grateful for being in town during his most recent hospitalizations, she was able to slow down with him and got to spend some quality time with him. And he celebrated her 60th surprise birthday party within the last month. Chad shared how he had a good talk by the pool at the villa in Mazatlan, thanks to Jack, he was able to pick dad's brain and spoke about life. He always downplayed his contribution 
on the aircraft carrier in World War II. He always said just the right things and shared stories of his childhood on the prairie and how it's not always easy. Life, that is. Life sl slowed down enough for them to have a heart to heart. He enjoyed the times he'd bowl with his grandpa, was amazed at the way he could make a bowling ball spin, even toward the end. He didn't have the strength to launch it like his grandson, but as he would seemingly just come to the end of his approach and just drop the ball after his approach, and the ball would pick up speed and spin, coming dangerously close to the gutter on the right, only to find the pocket for a strike. He was amazing. And if he missed it, he'd yell, I was robbed. <laughs> he'd say the same of others, you were robbed, or golly Ned again, or just, oh, fooey. Spencer reminded us, and others agreed, that he had a keen eye for fashion. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good eye, I said he had a keen eye. He was always very fashion conscious. Conscious, maybe, but more of a trendsetter. Okay, more of a man that made a fashion statement every time he hit the course, or the bowling alley to his matching belts, down to his matching socks that came up just under his shorts. <laughs> you saw the Orioles' uniform, orange shirt, orange socks, and cap out in the narthex. He was also on a Mazatlan trip. It was also on a Mazatlan trip that I roomed with my dad once. It was the first time since I was 16 years old that I slept in the same bed as my dad as we shared a king-size bed in the master suite, one of the master suites of one of the villas in Mazatlan, thanks to Jack. He and his sleep apnea machine, and I and mine. <laughs> and he was trying to have a conversation with me. Hard of hearing besides, through the mask, settling down for a much needed sleep. What time do we go for that horseback ride in the morning, he'd ask. 11 o'clock. 7 o'clock? Yes, 11 o'clock. At 6.30 in the morning, he was getting dressed on the edge of the bed. I had to call him back. Love never ends. Stories will go on. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. You should be so lucky. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. His love for knowledge never ended for my dad. He had the gift of woo. He loved people. He loved encouraging others. He loved accepting of others. And that never ended. His friends would tell you that. They witnessed that, and he witnessed it from his friends. His friends were lifelong and true. No matter what your political party, political candidates would come and go. Democrats would rarely win in South Dakota, especially lately, but that didn't stop his standing in their corner, blowing their horns for social justice and for the poor and for the hungry in each community he served. He led crop walks and even took the time to do some laugh therapy with parishioners in New England, Dolores said, where his church doubled in membership while he and Dolores were there. It was a new beginning for him there. They enjoyed trips to the beach, lobster feeds on the beach, and visiting all the historic sites together. He loved children and they loved him and trusted him. From camp days at Storm Mountain or Cochrane or Big Stone City or Lake Ponce at camp, he impacted, he impacted in positive ways the lives of many a young clergy and laity alike. 
when he fell from grace, as some of us are known to do, I got a note from my first Sunday school teacher in Brookings, South Dakota, Lorraine Wallstrom. She said, don't let anything bad take away all the good that your dad did for the church throughout his life. For we only know in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. Dad remembers Nick's hamburgers and great knee highs as a child. Burgers were a nickel back then. Now they're two bucks a piece. <laughs> and you'd have to have more than one. Although today with a crowd, just take one the first time through, unless you're family. <laughs> Unless your family, I said. <laughs> he loved the Peter Pan commercial, the Geico commercial at the class reunion where Peter comes flying in. Phil, Joanne, is that you? <laughs> you don't look a day over 70, am I right? <laughs> yes, Dad was playful. In some ways, he did never want to get old. He told me not long ago, you know, they say some people alive today may live to be 130. I think I'm that guy. <laughs> he really did thought, he really thought he'd live to be 100 easy. He did 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups every day since he joined the Navy at 17. Okay, so they were half push-ups, but he could do more than I could do. Um, a lot more. He was proud of older brothers who all served their time in different branches. Are there more seats in the back? What's the deal? <laughs> a patriot to the end. Michelle shared that he was a teacher. Even if it was just learning how to ride a bike and he'd stand on the porch in Brookings and yell from the front porch, Balance! <laughs> or riding a horse, our horse Bucky, together, double, bareback, until a pheasant spooked the horse and they both were on the ground. And he thought the horse fell on Michelle and he was up so fast. Or his good friend George McGovern. Or making popcorn the old fashioned way where you would heat the oil and you'd put the kernel in the middle of the oil and wait till that kernel popped and then you knew you could add the rest of the kernels. They shared, che shared tears from McDonald's commercials and Little House on the Prairie. Michelle reminded me of the big chair that would fit a father and a daughter at the year of eight years old in the district parsonage in Huron, a, a great chair for snuggling. And Annika said the same or when she wrestled with her major at SDSU, which she was a rabbit fan to the end, which makes it difficult to serve the church in Vermilion some days. <laughs> Where will your current major take you in 10 years, he'd ask when she was kind of waffling. What does your future look like if you change majors? And Michelle called my dad last Saturday afternoon as Becky and I sat with Dad in the ER at Avira's main hospital. You see, my sister Michelle and Dad would always share those two-minute moments together across the miles from Vermont to South Dakota. So she just called him like she normally did during the opening of the Breeders' Cup Classic where America, American Pharaoh was running and won and they shared that moment from the ER bed after we finally found the channel on TV. And they had that intimate moment together. Shannon shared how she loved how Annika would take his arm and walk with him, take his hand and walk with him, or help him get out of a chair, or the time they spent together. About the only time I'd see Dad cry was from this pulpit 
when he was telling a story from when he was in high school. I said his mother was somewhat of an angel. He told the story of wanting to go out on a Friday night with some friends in Brookings, and his mother said that he could go only under one condition. First, he'd have to pick potatoes, because it might freeze that night. Ah, oh, Mom, it'll be too late if I do that. But his mother, knowing his mother was too ill, and the other boys were already out of the house by them, it fell on him to do the job. So he grabbed a burlap bag and started at the far end of the row on the other side of the hill furthest from the farm. And as he approached, bent over to the brow of the hill, he saw his mother bent over picking potatoes in the same row. Yes, his mother taught him grace on a South Dakota farm. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Yes, Dad got to enjoy Kristen and Matt's wedding. A picture on the front of your bulletin cover, he was sitting right about over there and just kind of waiting for things to start. To Perry's 60th birthday party surprise. To a prayer that I had with him a week before he died. He bowled and played golf to the end. He didn't mind golfing by himself. In fact, he had four holes in one and two of them were witnessed. <laughs> I'm just saying that. Most people don't get a hole in one in a lifetime. You saw he does have one certificate on the back table. It was one week ago today, he was playing golf at probably the first course he played here in Sioux Falls. He was playing Elmwood because he thought they'd have more lax rules on driving the cart to your golf ball. And I saw the old pro, Mr. Comstock, who's sitting right back there. Um, he hasn't changed a bit since I was a little kid with my dad. But they had the same rule. You, you, you had to keep the cart on the path. And he was lying three when he hit his fourth shot, beautiful shot as he described it, right on the green on a par five hole. And he left the cart on the cart path and he walked up to the green and he felt a little winded and a little lightheaded, and so he paused. He said, I'm not sure why I paused, because the next thing I know, I'm on the ground. He said, those greens are pretty cold in November, especially when you're lying on them. He's not sure how long he laid there when he heard a voice, hey, mister, are you okay? Sir, do you need some help? So then he rolled over and said to the guy with all seriousness, yes, I always lie down on the green and rest a while after I make it here. No, I'm not all right. <laughs> call an ambulance. Well, I'll call 911, said the guy, and dad had his cell phone in his pocket, but the other guy didn't have a cell phone, drove his uh, car golf cart back to the clubhouse, called the... Uh, 911. And they came out and got him on a golf cart. And he joked later, a good thing it wasn't an emergency. <laughs> and by the way, I would have made my par, too. <laughs> no, I got the call that Monday night to come to the hospital where I met Dolores and Perry and Jack and later Bob. And when I arrived, Dr. Vasco was explaining to my dad and Dolores just how serious his condition was. Dick, your prognosis is grim, at best were his words. My dad looked at him and nodded. And after prayer for 
either finishing the round here on earth or up in heaven, or if he had more editorials to write to tick off his brother-in-law, we said goodbye for one last time. And Dad said, I can't think of anything funny to say. And I told him I had his back. And with a kiss on his forehead and a squeeze of his hand, he went on to his next great adventure. He was not afraid. He welcomed it. Recalling the story his mother had told him as a child of the reunion he'll have with his brothers, his pastor friends, colleagues, golf buddies, bowlers, parents, grandparents, and all those that he performed the ceremony for, the celebration of life with. And with that, he was whisked away to that great cloud of witnesses on November 2nd. Seemed kind of fitting. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Dolores and her girls and their family for rekindling his spirit of love and loving him. Because of her tender care, he lived a long and healthy life. I shouldn't have looked at my daughter. <laughs> uh, he lived a long and healthy life to the end. We should all be so lucky. Now, my dad was not a perfect man. He had his faults. <clears throat> my voice is still changing. Uh, <laughs> But as he said many times, I'm no saint, unless your definition is my definition of a saint, the saint that a saint is just a sinner who knows they're forgiven. That was my dad. He lived that, taught that, preached that, and lived it to the very end, and he will be missed by many. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Jesus says in John, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Blessed be his memory. From all of us, I love you, Dad. Amen. From the preacher of Ecclesiastes, we hear these words. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to, to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Then from Isaiah chapter, or verses 50, chapter 58, we see, read these words. Is not this the fast that I chose, to loose the bounds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see them naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator 
shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, and you shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If we remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the figure, figure, finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in darkness, and your gloom will be like noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places. And make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. The prophet continues. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known and have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Tradition within our connection of clergy is to share in a minister's chorus, and we're inviting them to come forward now to share it as well with my soul.
We share in the gospel lesson from the gospel of John. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you shall live also. I have said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom, Father, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. And then from... Matthew's Gospel, the chapter 25, uh, 34 through 46. And the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away from you, you cursed ones, and to the eternal fire prepared for devil and demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me any clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And they will reply, Lord, when will we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous, the righteous will go to eternal life. And from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, 6 through 8, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with him with burnt offerings with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oils? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Dolores, uh, Perry and Jack, Rick and Becky, Michelle and Chris, I've received many calls from people wanting me to share their condolences with you. Uh, people that can't be here today, uh, but they just wanted me to share that with you. And it's quite a few folks who've made that contact, so I just wanted you to know that today. Also, we know that Dick served both in the South Dakota Annual Conference and the New England Annual Conference and uh, the New England conference uh, sends their condolences as well and uh, they have a, a similar kind of format uh, that they just want to recognize Dick's ministry as well as as we do here in the Dakotas. Let us pray. God we are grateful for the power of your presence in our lives. We thank you for the gift of love. We thank you as we gather to not only uh, remember Dick and his life but we also gather to hear again the power of your word, the gift of your word that gives us strength and transforms our lives. Speak to us in this moment of death that we may truly experience and know the power of your resurrection. 
For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Henry David Thoreau was put in jail because of his opposition to America's involvement in the Mexican War. One of his friends came to visit him and looking through the jail bars said, Henry, what are you doing in there? Thoreau responded, I have to ask you, what are you doing out there? Sometimes bearing witness for the cause of justice is required of kingdom people. This morning we're gathered as the family and friends and colleagues of the Reverend Dick Pittenger. About 40 days ago, the family was gathered here. We celebrated a joyous wedding of Kristen and Matt. And we're here again to celebrate again, to celebrate the gift of Dick's life. However, we know as human beings, we had come to this occasion filled with many emotions. We gather to share in sorrow. We gather to remember. We gather in sadness. We gather to struggle with what is the meaning of death and life. And we gather to celebrate the joys of Dick's full life. In talking with many of Dick's uh, colleagues, he said to me that Dick was a prophet, a preacher, and a pastor. Our passage from Micah reminds us that God desires of us as God's people. God doesn't want our sacrifices, but God wants us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. A prophet is one who speaks on the behalf of God, the truth of God for God's people. The methods are teach, enlighten, chastise, or even criticize. B. David Napier, an Old Testament professor, describes the prophet Elijah as one who had to share God's message, like a fire burning in his bones. Dick had a fire burning in his heart for the justice, for the lost, the hurting, and the suffering in this world. He led the way and encouraged many other pastors and preachers to bear witness to the prophetic call of God in this world, even to personal threats. He had a gift of preaching, he had a way of speaking and writing, and, and the phrases and words were remarkable. He loved being a pastor. When he was in the New England Conference, one of the churches he served, he walked the painful journey of cancer with a, a young girl, Andrea. He really dug in to, to try to help encourage her and they shared jokes and they watched Three Stooges and they would repeat the Three Stooges' jokes and just continue to share laughter. He walked along that painful journey with her until her death. And as many pastors and others know, when you walk that pain of empathy, sometimes it's so deep that it, that it pains us deeply as well. Dick was a pastor. He was a mentor, an encourager, a guide to many clergy and laity in ministry. Uh, his uh, group, the Higgins Bible Study Group that he was with, uh, they're all over here kind of in his honor today as he enjoyed being with them each Tuesday or every other Tuesday to, to think about the scriptures. He was an encourager to me uh, as he was in worship here, encouraged many people. He faced many difficult times and struggles, but he lived the journey of a prophet, a preacher, and a pastor. As we heard Rick shared, he loved his family. He enjoyed bowling, the holy roller bowling, and of course, golf. He was also very honored to serve in the Navy and really took pride in that. In fact, he had a hat, you know, that World War II hat uh, with the honor flight, and he, that thing had to pretty much stay around him just his representing of his patriotism. Like all of us, Dick wasn't perfect, um, and yet he lived a life of grace and offered grace to heal a broken and suffering world. And of course, we heard his sense of humor. Our reading from John, the gospel, is a very familiar words of Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come to you and take you to myself. Words of promise, words of hope. Jesus never leaves our sides. Jesus seeks us out, the least, the lost, and the last. Dick always talked about how death was going on the next great adventure. 
And you know, often the, the best adventures in life are those that are unplanned. The ones where you take the journey or the trip and you experience the back roads, the off the beaten path places of our country and world. He looked at this journey from life to death as that next great adventure. Jesus tells us not to be afraid. Jesus tells us he will not leave us orphaned. Jesus comes to us and gives us peace. A peace that the world can't give us. My friends, death is not the end. As faithful followers and believers in Jesus Christ, we open ourselves to the next great adventure. We experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. A lady once told her pastor that she wanted to be buried with a fork in her hand. This is an old story that most people know. When the pastor asked why, she said, when I was a little girl and we had our Christmas dinner, my mother would always say, save your fork. The best is yet to come. And in fact, for us, that's Nick's burgers and ice cream. <laughs> the next is best to come. So friends, let us heed the call to be prophets, witnessing to the word of God with compassion and love. Let us open our lives to participate in God's kingdom, not only here on earth, but knowing that a great adventure of God's kingdom lies ahead. And as the prophet Micah tells us, let us love justice, let us love kindness, and let us walk humbly with God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dick would like to sing and have everybody sing with us, so join in. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I Twilight is fading and day soon shall end. I get homesick the farther I roam. But my father has led me each step of the 
Let us pray. God of love, we thank you for all which you have blessed us even to this day, for the gift of joy and days of health and strength, for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise and days of pain and grief. Today, Lord, we praise you for home and friends, for our baptism and place in your church, with all who have faithfully lived and died. And above all else, we thank you for Jesus who knew our grief, who died our death and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us. And as he taught us, so now we pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Again, on behalf of the family, we want to thank each of you for being here this day and uh, celebrating Dick's life with them. We invite you to stay for a time of lunch immediately following the service. And uh, we'll just go directly into the fellowship hall and we will uh, we'll just have a short blessing here now for that. And then we'll stand and share in the benediction. So let us pray. God, we thank you for the, the rich memories that we've shared this day. We pray that as we continue the worship that we would go forth to know and continue and bless those who have prepared this food that we may joyously experience your presence and your love in fellowship together. So bless us. Amen. Let us stand. Dick had a had a special uh, had a special graveside ceremony, uh, and I'm using that ceremony as we uh, move forward with our benediction. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And since the first Easter morning, when the followers of Jesus came to pay their respects at the tomb. They were met with the message of the angel. He is not here. He is risen. Ever since that time, the followers of Jesus have met at the graves of their loved ones in confident assurance that their loved ones share the immortality that Jesus lived and taught and promised to his followers. Therefore, inasmuch as the spirit of Dick has entered into this life immortal, we thereby commit Dick's body to its resting place, but his spirit we commend to God. Remembering how Jesus said upon the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Let us pray. Our creator God, surround us as we are here today by your many evidences of thy creative hand. We are grateful for the teaching of our Lord that thou hast placed us at the pinnacle of thy creation and made to have eternal fellowship with thee and with those we love. Help us now once more to return to live lives worthy of him who we honor today and even more worthy of the Son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.